Hello and welcome to Vibrant Lives podcast, formerly Amanda's Wellbeing podcast. This is a podcast dedicated to health and well-being, featuring interviews with experts in the fields of nutrition, physical and mental health, and my five-minute food facts series. I am Amanda Hayes, your host, a lawyer turned nutritionist. I have a deep curiosity about living a healthy, active and fulfilling life, which I would call a vibrant life, and sharing what I learn with you on this podcast. Before I introduce today's guest, I will let you know that any information or advice provided in Vibrant Lives podcast is not intended to treat or cure disease or medical conditions, and it is never a substitute for advice from your own health professional. Today I am here with Dr. Jane Chalmers, Senior Lecturer in Pain Sciences at the University of South Australia. We're going to talk about pelvic pain, Jane's area of research, something that can affect both men and women. And then we will shine a light on an area that Jane is passionate about, and that is women's health. We'll talk about period pain, the pelvic floor, and the big O. Hi, Jane. Hi. Thank you for coming on Vibrant Lives podcast. Thanks for having me. So, Jane, you studied physiotherapy and then went on to do a PhD. So what drew you towards physiotherapy? I think I was similar to lots of other people. I was always that kid who was running around with too much energy. So (laughs) I was always interested in sport. Um, And I think I knew that I always wanted to help people. So Mm -hmm. I thought about, you know, trying to become a doctor. Uh, but I'm also a sympathetic vomiter, <laughs> oh. so I knew that being a doctor wouldn't work too well. So the kind of the sport aspect and then wanting to help people was what initially drew me into physiotherapy and then I was hooked. Excellent. Uh, it's interesting you should say that because a lot of the physios I've interviewed have all said they wanted to help people, so that's a common thread. And then you went on and did a PhD. So what was your PhD topic? So my PhD looked at pelvic pain and it was a little bit of a mixed bag of things. Um, Lots of PhDs tell a really lovely, coherent story Mm -hmm. and mine is not one of those. It sort of started that way where we had a a plan of what we wanted to do Um, in terms of looking at pelvic pain. I was quite interested in looking at a condition called vulvodynia, which is Mm -hmm. unexplained pain of the vulva. Mm -hmm. So it's where women will have a painful vulva, but no kind of um, infection or um, anything that's present that would indicate right. why they would have pain. So no obvious reason for it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I sort of started my journey wanting to look at vulvodynia, which we did. But along the way, I kind of realized that there was just so much that we didn't know right. about pelvic pain and about vulvodynia. So it did evolve a lot and changed. Mm-hmm. So the first part of my PhD, we actually moved away from vulvodynia and looked more broadly at pelvic pain Mm -hmm. and looked at developing a questionnaire to look at how pelvic pain impacts the lives of women. Because early on in my PhD, when I was looking at what outcome measures we might use as part of our vulvodynia studies, I realized that actually we didn't have many outcome measures that looked at things outside of just pain and other symptoms. And I'm kind of interested in how pain influences the way that we live our lives, not just actually, you know, on a scale of zero to 10, how bad is your pain? I'm interested in those things that what does your pain stop you from doing? How does it actually impact your day-to-day life? So we ended up developing what we call the pelvic pain impact questionnaire, which is a 10 item questionnaire that looks at how um, pelvic pain, any sort of pelvic Mm -hmm. pain in women impacts um, their day-to-day life. So that was what we started with, with my PhD. And then I moved into the vulvodynia part of it. So we undertook a couple of reviews looking at whether we could understand the sort of um, physiology behind vulvodynia a little bit more. Um, And in particular, I was interested in the immune system and inflammation. Um, But the reviews that we did kind of were not particularly conclusive. Vulvodynia is sometimes thought of as as an inflammatory condition, Mm -hmm. but our reviews sort of found that actually some studies suggest it is an inflammatory condition and some suggest that it's not. Right. So do you think there needs to be more work done in this area? I think there definitely does. And in particular, our review highlighted that we need studies of higher quality right. in particular. Yeah. Um, and that really added to the sort of inconsistencies that we found. We had a lot of studies 
that weren't particularly um, rigorous in the way mm-hmm. that they were designed. Oh, okay. And and small numbers of participants, yeah. which always makes it hard to yeah to draw conclusions. Absolutely, that's one of the um, issues with scientific studies, isn't it? Getting outcomes that are reliable. And, yeah, 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 and making yeah. sure that we plan studies before we undertake them to make sure that they give us data that we can actually yeah. rely on and be confident in and some of the studies and apply yeah definitely yeah. definitely um and then the the final study of my phd was quite interesting it was a a mouse model of vulvodynia where we were investigating immune responses in uh, mice vulva which oh my goodness <laughs> it must be <laughs> like a tiny <laughs> It very, was yeah. very tiny. Yeah. I had scales that would weigh all of the bits of tissue and the scales can can weigh half a piece of hair. They're that oh my goodness. specific. Yeah. Wow. It was really interesting. Um, but I did find it quite hard because I'm quite an animal lover. So yes. doing a mouse study was quite difficult for me. And at the end of my PhD, I, I thought, it, that was really good to do, but I don't want to do any more animal studies. Yeah, it's really tricky, isn't it, that area of, you know, to progress. It's often where one has to go. But yeah. it's, uh, yeah, there's always that problem with working with animals. Jane, if we talk more generally then about pelvic pain, can we start with the basics and tell? can you tell us in lay terms, I guess, about the pelvis so where is it in the body what does it look like yeah so it's that bony kind of bowl that sits at the bottom of our abdomen but above our hips so it's the sort of piece of our body that connects I suppose the bottom of our torso Mm -hmm. to our legs so if you kind of pop your hands on your hips you can feel the nice crests of your pelvis and it and it runs from those outside bits that you can feel um, right around to the front to the pubic bone at the front and around to the back to the base of your spine so it's the lovely little bit at the bottom of our torso that keeps everything in and connects our torso to our legs and do men and women have different pelvises or what are the differences they definitely do Mm. I mean our bony structures are somewhat similar in terms of we both have the the pelvic bones there but obviously our reproductive systems are very different within the pelvis so they're different on the inside and they're also different on the outside but the bones themselves are a little bit different too men tend to have a narrower pelvis Mm -hmm. women tend to have a wider more flat pelvis and we have a wider pelvic inlet which is sort of the hole at the bottom that lets things pass through like a baby's head, for like example. A baby's head. It's yeah. pretty nifty how evolution works like that, isn't it? <laughs> does the pelvis, when we're when women are giving birth, does it kind of expand? Do the bones expand? The bones themselves I mean, don't expand, but the ligaments that hold sorry, the that's, bones. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what that sounds more reasonable. Yes, <laughs> the ligaments that hold it together do, which is a really nifty little mechanism that we have. So the hormone relaxin that's released towards the end of pregnancy, mm-hmm. um, that really sort of spikes when when labour is initiated, helps to really relax those ligaments, um, so that yeah, a baby's head and body can pass through a yeah. bit more easily. I remember with. Um, one of my children, the obstetrician, said to me, he was looking at the ultrasound and he said, your baby has a very sensible sized head. <laughs> Music. good of your baby to be sensible in the womb. <laughs> Music to my ears. <laughs> and so uh, in terms of pelvic pain, I understand there are numerous causes. Um, as you've alluded to, sometimes we don't actually know what they are, but it can arise from the reproductive system, urinary or digestive systems, musculoskeletal system or other sources. So what then are the most common sources of pelvic pain in women and in men? In women and in men, there's always some conditions that can overlap. So Mm -hmm. things like irritable bowel syndrome can occur in men and women. And because a lot of those symptoms occur in that pelvic region, we consider that pelvic pain. But looking at things that affect women in particular, one of the big ones that's particularly been in the media a lot in the last couple of years is endometriosis. Yeah. And that's a condition where cells similar to the lining of the uterus grow on the outside of the uterus in other places. And what can happen is those cells can become quite inflammatory and Mm -hmm. form little lesions between 
um, some of the organs in the pelvic and abdominal cavity and they get sort of stuck together instead of being nice Mm. and smooth and slippery, um, which of course results often in a lot of pain. Um, And endometriosis is really common. It's about one in nine women in Australia. Yeah. Are, are there any um, cures for it or treatments? There's no cure. We don't right. yet have a cure, um, but there are lots of different treatments, mm-hmm. but the level at which someone will respond to particular treatments can really vary. Um, a lot of women have endometriosis, which is managed really well mm-hmm. um, through different treatment methods, but other women really struggle with pain and infertility and other problems oh, for a long time. Terrible. It can be hugely impactful yeah. on women's lives. Um, other things in women that a lot of people will have heard of are things like period pain. Yeah. And Australian studies show that around 70% of women have significant period pain, um, as well as vulvodynia, which was sort of the topic of my PhD, mm-hmm. which is around one in 10 women. Right. So even though we don't hear about vulvodynia very often, it's certainly pretty common Mm. Um, well that's interesting I I wonder if we don't hear about it because it's still I guess there's almost like a taboo area still very private people don't talk about it in public perhaps definitely definitely Mm. I often say um you know around the stigma around pelvic pain problems is that you'd be really happy to go to a dinner party and say I've had really bad low back pain this week but you'd never go to a dinner party and say Guys, my vulva has burnt all week. You know, no, it's you just would, you not, just wouldn't, would you? It's just not a, a topic of conversation that we feel naturally comfortable having. Yeah. So, I think that certainly adds a barrier to mm. um, hearing about it and learning about it. Yeah. So, I think a lot of women suffer in silence with those sorts of things. And then, in terms of men or male pelvic pain um, syndromes that we see, prostatitis is a really common one, and, and lots of men will have will have heard about mm-hmm. that. And prostatitis is normally considered some kind of infection or inflammation within the prostate that can mean that it becomes enlarged. But another really common uh, condition that occurs is what's called chronic prostatitis, chronic pelvic pain syndrome, which is a bit of a mouthful to say. But it's basically someone who has pain in the region of the prostate, but similar to vulvodynia in women we can't identify what the cause or sort of um, pathology behind right. that pain might be. So it's men who have this prostate pain but no underlying cause, mm. which, again, is really tough to yeah. then work out some treatments for for those men. Um, and it's really common as well. It's around 1 in 12 men will develop chronic prostatitis, chronic pelvic pain syndrome across the course of their life. So another really common thing that we don't hear about very often. Yeah, the same kind of, I guess, oh, stigma is probably too strong. But as you say, people don't really talk about it yeah, a lot. Yeah, mm. definitely. And I think... Um, as a society, we're becoming a bit better with talking mm. about those sorts of things, but I think we've still got a long way to go before we're talking about pelvic health yes. in the same way that we might talk about a broken arm. Yeah, yeah. I think we've made progress in terms of breast health Definitely. For women. Definitely. Um, there's so much information out there available now, which is great. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And I think that's a really great example of how we can break down some of those barriers yeah. and that taboo around a topic that's not normally spoken about very often. Breast cancer awareness is really widespread now, which is fantastic. Yeah. I'd really love to see pelvic health get the same sort of Yeah, I can awareness. see why. It's it's so common. It's more common than I knew, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and are there, when we're talking about pelvic pain, Are there some general symptoms that are common to people suffering from it or is it just too broad an area and it's different for everyone? It is really different for everyone and it really depends on, um, I suppose, what's driving driving the pain for different people. It's different for men and women, but even two two people of the same sex who have the same condition Mm. can experience things really differently. Yeah. Um, A really common example of that is endometriosis where some women will actually not experience any pain and the first sort of symptom that they have of endometriosis is infertility. Right. So we contrast that with other women who maybe have horrific periods and lots of pain with certain activities um, who also have endometriosis. They often find out a lot younger because that pain interferes with their daily life a lot more. So even within the same condition and, and the same sort of extent of that disease process women can present so differently and it's the same for all pelvic pain conditions Mm. 
Mm, that makes sense because there are so many different potential causes. With endometriosis, is there is it something that occurs... Do we know the causes, I guess, or it's genetic or? No, we don't know the causes yet. And at the moment, there's heaps of research going on oh, around good. the world looking at that, which is fantastic. We, we do know a couple of things about it. It seems to be related to um, hormones in mm-hmm. some way in that we see um, that hormones can really drive some of the, the symptoms that we see in people. There's certainly some component of genetics to it. Um, Because we know that women who have a direct family member with endometriosis are seven times more likely to be diagnosed with endometriosis than someone who doesn't have a direct family link. So there's certainly some kind of family relationship which would suggest a genetic component, Mm -hmm. but we haven't yet worked out exactly what that is. I wonder if one day we'll find um, a gene mutation like with the breast cancer uh, with I the BRCA, the BRCA, BRCA genes, yeah, the yeah BRCA we genes. can only hope, I think. We can only hope. That would be amazing if we could. And Jane, can you talk us through some of the pelvic pain interventions that you've been involved in and what you've learnt through your research? Yeah, sure. My research has really focused on conservative treatment options. So with my background as a physio, I'm less concerned with or my research is less concerned with medications and surgery and those sorts of things and more concerned with what can women do at home or what can they do with physios so part of my research has looked at exercise Mm -hmm. um, particularly for period pain yeah so we um, undertook quite a large systematic review with a, a team of researchers where I was previously at Western Sydney University And we found that exercise can be really helpful for reducing period pain in women. But we did identify that of the research that's out there, there's not much actually that looks at high intensity stuff. Right. That was my next question. What kind of exercise? Yeah. So yoga and stretching is the sort of biggest body of literature that we've got that shows that those sorts of exercise can be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the moment, we don't have too much that's looking at your more high intensity of running and CrossFit and those sorts of activities. So we're sort of in the middle of running a study in conjunction with F45. Oh, right. Yeah. Interesting. Looking at high intensity exercise and how that might influence someone's period pain. Unfortunately, we were halfway through recruitment when COVID hit. Oh, dear. (laughs) Yes. So um, we haven't finished the study yet, but um, our preliminary results that we do have are quite promising. We've had some feedback from participants that the more they do CrossFit when they don't have their period, the better their periods seem to be. Okay, that's very interesting. Yeah. One thing they did note, though, is that um, high-intensity exercise while they were experiencing their period and while they were having period pain could exacerbate their pain sometimes. Right, but not all the time. Not all the time. Um, And there seems to be sort of two categories of women, those who high-intensity exercise on their period makes their period pain better Mm -hmm. and those um, who while they're on their period and have period pain do high intensity exercise makes it worse yeah it's interesting uh, I think an interesting concept for a study because when you're experiencing period pain it's not your natural inclination I don't think to go and do high intensity exercise which might be why there hasn't been a lot of study yeah I mean I think your natural feelings would be to go and do something relaxing like yeah. yoga yes exactly mm. and I think that like you say that's part of the problem the the sort of natural inclination is to not go out and do this high intensity stuff makes sense yeah so. but I guess if um, you recruit people and they do it and you have a positive result it can be put out there as information like you might not feel like doing it but it will make you feel better, yeah. reduce your pain. Mm. And I think that kind of makes sense. You know, those happy hormones that we get after we do exercise, yeah. those sort of endorphins, it makes sense that that would help to manage pain. But like you say, that sort of motivation to get there in yeah. the first place and to really pump yourself up when you're already feeling pretty awful is really difficult. It's mm. really difficult. And while we're talking about period pain, obviously you're um, very interested in women's health. And I've read somewhere, I hope you don't mind me saying this, Jane, that you suffered from horrific period pain since you were a teenager, and that's what sparked your interest in women's health. 
So can you tell us, Jane, what was that pain like for you? Because I can imagine that many people listening will be able to relate to that. Yeah, I it it's very common. Period mm, pain is such is. a common problem for women. Certainly as an early teen, um, my period pain was horrific. It really was. I have quite vivid memories of curl, being curled up in my bed with my hot water bottle yeah. against my tummy with my mum sort of coming in and just saying, I don't, I don't know what to do. And me saying, I don't know what to do either. And I just feel awful. We were living um, in quite a remote community mm-hmm. um, in really remote South Australia, um, which I think added a layer of complexity in terms of being able to seek help. Yeah, The only sort of health or medical person who was in our community was a community nurse. Um, And she wasn't really sure what to do with me, but I was quite lucky that my mum quite quickly sort of said, this isn't normal and we need to to get this investigated. So um, it was pretty awful, but at the same time, I'm one of the lucky few whose period pain was actually managed quite well from quite a young age. Um, And mine, I'm super lucky and I'm sure there's lots of women who are listening going, oh, damn her. (laughs) But I, I'm, I am really lucky that my symptoms are really well managed on the oral contraceptive pill. Okay. That's a very common treatment, isn't it? Yeah, it mm. is. It is. And it, it doesn't work for everyone, which is why I say there's probably women listening at home who are not so happy hearing it. But I recognize that I'm one of the lucky ones, which I'm just really fortunate. And that's been sort of a, a huge savior for me. It doesn't mm doesn't get rid of my pain completely but it certainly makes it much more manageable you know when I was an early teen I was missing days of school yeah I was going to ask you that Mm. yeah and and now every now and again I might have a day where I don't feel like going to work but I still do I might be a little bit less productive but I certainly it being on the pill helps me to Um, function and and not miss out on the things that I want to do. Yeah, exactly. Do you think it's a hormone related issue then? Because the pill, I don't know a lot about the oral contraceptive pill, but it is, it does uh, change your hormone balance. Is that right? Yeah, definitely. Mm. And I think um, particularly for teenagers where we know that the body fluctuates in hormones and, and the body's trying to regulate the level of hormones that it has. I think that's why period pain is quite common in teens because yeah. hormones are running rampant. Um, but certainly the oral contraceptive pill can help to regulate um, your levels of prostaglandins in particular, mm-hmm. um, which we know are really pro-inflammatory and they contribute to some of that cramping that we get. Um, but Certainly the control of hormones is yeah. is a really important thing and really helpful for controlling period pain, which makes me think, yeah, it's definitely oh, a hormone. We women, we have to put up with so much, don't we? <laughs> I know, we do, we do. So you've already mentioned that exercise is a promising intervention for period pain. Yeah. Some people take Panadol, I guess, to relieve the pain. Are there any other things women can do, do you think? There's heaps of things. Um, I suppose one of the things, and I'm not a medical doctor, so anyone who's listening who might be interested um, in other sorts of medications should definitely consult their doctor. But um, even better than Panadol are some of the um, anti-inflammatory medications that we have that help to control the prostaglandins, which Mm -hmm. are some of those um, hormones that contribute to the cramping and the, um, the contraction of the uterine wall during our periods. Um, so there's medications um, like naproxen or in Australia it's it's sold under the brand name Ponstan, okay. which is really effective um, in reducing the level of some of those prostaglandins. So even better than Panadol is reaching for something that's period pain specific. Right. But a really important thing is um, you have to get onto it early. You can't take it like Panadol where you have a headache and you take Panadol and it gets better. Right. Because of the way that Ponstan works, it aims to stop the production of prostaglandins in right. the first place. Okay. So you need to get onto it early and start taking it early. So that's a really good one. But like I said, for anyone who is listening, go and speak to your doctor um, about whether Ponstan might be an effective thing um, for you. But outside of medications, in particular for period pain, heat is another yeah. a really great method. We've got quite good evidence now to support the use of particularly those new heat patches yeah. that you can get, the yeah. wearable heat patches. They're amazing because you don't you no longer need to carry around a hot water bottle or a wheat wheat bag. You can pop on those heat patches and they're much more um, discreet, I suppose, yes. which is great for women. 
But obviously exercise, like we've spoken about too, mm-hmm. I think, like I said before, it's it's kind of just important to think about what sort of exercise fits individual people yes. best. Not everyone's going to respond <clears throat> to high intensity exercise and not everyone's going to respond to yoga or stretching. It's There's never going to be a one size fits all approach. It's going to be working out what works best for a particular individual. So it sounds like it's good to try various different things and see what works. Definitely. I think um, there's a lot of trial and error that's always involved in working out someone's best outcomes for health. Not a one size fits all approach. Yes. Now I'd like to talk a bit about the pelvic floor. This is something you hear about for many women for the first time when you're pregnant. Yes. (laughs) So can you talk us a bit through the pelvic floor? What makes up the pelvic floor? Where is it? That kind of thing. Sure. The pelvic floor is really a a group of of flat muscles that lie at the bottom of our pelvis. So they run from the pubic bone at the front Mm -hmm. through to our sacrum or our tailbone at the back, and they form a really nice floor of our pelvis. So if you imagine you're sitting on a chair, it's, it's a floor that is the contact area. Um, where your your pelvis meets the chair. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're really important muscles for us because they're the things that help to keep our insides in. <laughs> yes, so the bladder and everything down in exactly. the lower half of our body. Exactly. Mm. And they're the, the really important muscles that, that we use when we need to wee, but there's not a toilet nearby. We engage those muscles yep. to make sure that we remain continent or if we're in a an important business meeting and we need to pass wind, but we know that it won't quite be appropriate at this point in time. Is it ever appropriate? (laughs) (laughs) Look, as a pelvic health physio, I have to say there are appropriate times Mm. to pass wind. We shouldn't be stopping it at all times, but certainly in the middle of a big business meeting, probably people won't be responding so well to that. So it's our pelvic floor muscles that Mm. help us to... To keep that in. In in our house, the dog, he passes wind a lot. I know. I mean, he gets blamed, is what I mean. <laughs> it's always the dog, isn't always. it? It's always the dog. <laughs> As I said, during pregnancy, for me, that was really the first time I became aware of my pelvic floor muscles and we were told to do or advised to do um, pelvic floor exercises, sometimes known as Kegel exercises. Could you tell us, Jane what they are and and why they're important and perhaps give us one or two examples. Sure. Um, Kegel exercises or pelvic floor exercises are are similar to any other exercise that we would do to get stronger muscles in the body. So pelvic floor exercises just describe normally someone going through a period of focusing on making sure that they contract those muscles Mm -hmm. to get them nice and strong. And like you say, we normally only hear about it when you're pregnant or when something goes wrong yes. if you're incontinent. Um, but pelvic floor exercises are just really great as sort of a maintenance exercise. We all want to make sure that we've got a strong pelvic floor so that we can hold in things that we need to hold in when it's not appropriate to let them out. Um, so it is really important to do them. Um, but to give you an example of um, one, I mean, we're sitting down in chairs now and I like to um, I like to get people to sit with their feet flat on the mm-hmm. floor and to just feel the contact that your pelvic floor will make with the chair. I always get people to start with belly breathing or okay. diaphragmatic, diaphragmatic breathing where you just want to relax through your shoulders and breathe in deeply through your belly. Mm -hmm. I'm doing this now. (laughs) And as you do that, you want to make sure that you maintain that breathing, that belly breathing. And as you inhale into your belly on the next breath, think about trying to gently squeeze your pelvic floor like you're stopping yourself from passing wind or you're holding onto urine. You want to hold it for a few seconds and let it go. And there are lots of other cues that we might use. So another cue might be that we gently lift the pelvic floor away from the seat. Mm-hmm. So trying to really feel that visual or, or provide that visual imagery yeah. of something lifting. For women, a really neat um, sort of imagery or, or thing that they can imagine is feeling as though they're trying to squeeze their vagina to try and lift a tampon a little bit higher okay. inside the vagina. 
And for men, my favourite visual imagery to give them is to pretend that they're at the beach and they're sort of thigh mid thigh depth in the water and they can see a little wave approaching them and they know that the water's a bit cold and as the wave passes them they need to engage their pelvic floor and just lift their testicles a little bit so that the wave doesn't mean that their testicles get wet (laughs) and surprisingly it works quite well (laughs) oh they'll do anything to protect them (laughs) yes exactly Uh so Clearly, men should engage in pelvic floor exercises as well. Definitely, definitely. Mm. I think we hear about it a lot more in women because it's certainly an area that can go wrong for women more than it does for men. Um, But really, it's important to um, engage those muscles um, to make sure that we we can use those functions Mm. of those muscles appropriately um, for men and for women. So for women, because of um, giving birth to to children is does that I guess that has an impact then on the pelvic floor muscles does it yeah it can it Mm. really depends on the birth and and what's happened during the birth Um, so obviously women who have tears and those sorts of things of the muscles that can that can damage the muscles but as well carrying that extra weight for nine months is also a lot of downward pressure on the pelvic floor So that in itself can actually mean that the pelvic floor becomes weakened, which is why you often hear about doing Kegels or pelvic floor exercises during pregnancy. So certainly birth can impact um, pelvic floor function. And how often then should we do these Kegel exercises in an ideal world? (laughs) In an ideal world, I guess it really depends. So anyone with pain, Um, We often say don't do pelvic floor exercises. And in fact, we often advise them to do the opposite. Right. We want them to actually down train the pelvic floor because in pelvic pain, we often see the pelvic floor becomes really tight and overly protective. The pain, perhaps. Yeah, Mm. exactly. The same as you would if you broke your arm. Yeah. You know, you'd hold it and you'd try and splint it. It's our pelvic floor trying to protect us. Um, But what that means is that any sort of activation of those muscles is just going to promote some of that tension holding. Mm -hmm. And we know that that can eventually become a source of pain in itself. So we often ask women to engage in down training where we're actually asking them to relax the pelvic floor rather than engage it. But for anyone who doesn't have pain, we generally say that we want them to um, do their exercises as they would as if they're going to the gym. So we want to see them engaging in pelvic floor exercises two or three days a week. Mm -hmm. And as part of that, we want them to do three sets of around 12 repetitions. And one repetition is just engaging the pelvic floor and holding it from somewhere between three and 10 seconds and then relaxing it. Okay. And a really important part is that relaxation of the pelvic floor. Um, because it's important not only to engage it, but to yeah. make sure that it can also relax when we need it to, because that's part of part of its function is that mm. we can engage it and relax it when it like needs to. Like any muscle. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So we want to work it through its full range. Jane, I understand that you're doing some further work at the moment and you're looking at self-management and pain education. So what are you doing in that space? So self-management is something that I've I've done a little bit of previously, which includes exercise, but um, particularly around endometriosis, we were interested in some of the things that women were doing at home, Mm -hmm. not under the provision of any health or medical practitioner. We were just really interested. What else were women doing to manage their symptoms of endometriosis? Um, And we found that there were kind of three key things that women were doing that were helpful for them. Um, So the first one was using cannabis. And that was quite an interesting finding because At the time that we ran the survey, cannabis was still illegal throughout Australia. So despite that, we still had around 13% of our participants who reported using cannabis. As in smoking it or ingesting it? There were different methods that they were using Mm -hmm. to kind of engage with cannabis use. Smoking it and ingesting it were the two kind of common common things. Um, But other things as well were heat and dietary changes too. So switching to a low inflammatory diet seemed to be quite helpful for a lot of women Mm -hmm. with endometriosis. Um, But the other thing that I'm working on at the moment that I'm really excited about is um, we are about to start a project which is being funded by the Hospital Research Foundation 
looking at pain education for women with endometriosis. Oh, fantastic. I imagine that will be very helpful for many women. Yeah, and we're hoping to target women just before they have a laparoscopy. So that's how how endometriosis is diagnosed. Mm -hmm. You have to have a laparoscopy, which is where small incisions are made through your abdomen and pelvis and a little camera is inserted to basically look for some of those inflammatory lesions that I mentioned before. And in back pain, there's some research that suggests if we educate people before they have surgery for their back pain, we can help to reduce their pain and we help to reduce the amount of money that they spend on healthcare after their surgery. So we're hoping that we can do something similar in women with endometriosis. If we can help them to understand what endometriosis is and what pain is and how it works and provide them with some strategies to reduce their pain and make sure that they're staying engaged in the activities that they want to do. We're hoping that we can help with some of those outcomes post-surgery. So So that sounds really practical, which is great. It's good when scientific research is translated into something that people can actually, you know, do and use. Yeah. And that's, that's sort of the aim of most of my research now is looking at that translational side Mm. of things. And actually, The Hospital Research Foundation, who is funding this research, um, actually provided or the the funding is provided through their translation grant. So the funding is specifically Mm. for translational projects. So, And Jane, do you know if there are any uh, websites or groups that women with endometriosis can look at or join? Definitely. There's there's lots in mm. Australia now. Some of the big ones are Endoactive and Endometriosis Australia. So they're sort of the key advocacy groups for women with endometriosis. The other one for women with endo but also other types of pelvic pain is the Pelvic Pain Foundation of Australia. Mm-hmm. And they've also got resources for men too. So Great. it's a really inclusive website, which is excellent. But the other place is social media. There's lots of support groups on social media. Most um, states will have uh, a state-based endometriosis support group and they provide support virtually, but a lot of them also meet up in person, which um, from conversations that I've had with with some of my research participants, they've found that really helpful to sort of have that shared experience. Yeah, I can really see how that would be helpful. It, It makes me think a bit of when you have your first child and you're sort of looking at this creature thinking, what on earth do I do with it? (laughs) And And you need that support. You have friendships with other women going through the same thing. And, you know, that's almost a lifesaver for so many women. So I can imagine with a condition like endometriosis, connecting with others going through the same thing, because it could be that people you talk to in your daily life who don't have it don't really understand what it's like. Yeah, definitely, mm. definitely. And I think that's such a huge um, barrier for women as well in that um, understanding someone's experience with pelvic pain um, can be really tricky for someone who doesn't have yeah. pelvic pain. So, mm. yeah, being able to get that peer support I think is so vital. Yeah, I agree. So I will put some links to those um, social media sites and websites in the show notes. And, Jane, I cannot have you here sitting with me and not ask you about the female orgasm because you've written an article about it for the conversation. So can you explain to us in a medical sense, I guess, or physiological sense, what's actually taking place in our bodies, in women's bodies, when we have an orgasm? Sure. (laughs) I have to giggle a little bit because that article, I think, was much more controversial than I'd anticipated it to be, which is good. It sparked some discussion and some debate, but it's always interesting when, when things like the female orgasm enter the public space in in a, a place like The Conversation, yeah. which is sort of a news outlet, um, some of the the, the feedback and, and the opinions that are expressed are quite interesting. Mm. But the article that I wrote was, was about um, things that researchers are looking at in regards yeah. to the female orgasm, and one of them is just what is the female orgasm? Yeah, what, what happens? Yeah. It's really complex. Um, and we kind of know some of the things that we can observe that happen with orgasms, but we don't really know why they happen in the first place. And we don't necessarily understand how all of the bits fit together, which is really tricky. So we certainly have a lot more research that needs to be done. But 
Some of the things that we do know is that when women orgasm, we see women have these really rhythmic uh, contractions of their Mm -hmm. pelvic floor. And it's often thought that this is to get blood out of some of those um, tissues that are erect, the clitoris and the vulva in particular. We see women's heart rate, their respiration rate and their blood pressure all go up. Mm -hmm. We also see um, levels of oxytocin increase and oxytocin is the love drug (laughs) and uh we also see areas of the brain associated with dopamine which is our happy hormone increase as well so we get all of those sort of feel good um so it sounds like it's very good for you it is certainly very good (laughs) for you i would encourage everyone to engage in it more often (laughs) really interestingly though um some research has looked at the different areas of the brain that are activated and certainly our our dopamine areas, our happy hormone areas are activated, but also particular areas that are associated with our consciousness are mm-hmm. also activated. And I find that really fascinating that, that is. women often describe orgasms as this altered state of consciousness yeah. or an out-of-body experience. And I think that's all created by our brain. And I just, I find that fascinating. That that is indeed fascinating. So just so I can picture this, so to study that kind of thing, women would have to have electrodes or something on their brains and have an orgasm. Yes. That would be tricky. (laughs) There are some really interesting methods by which researchers have looked at the female orgasm, but all of them are probably as you'd picture that they would be. Yes, yeah. electrodes placed on the head or women are placed into um, an fMRI machine which measures brain activity and blood flow in the brain and, and women reach orgasm somehow. And in some studies, they look at the difference between if a woman reaches orgasm herself mm-hmm. versus if a partner induces an orgasm and those sorts of things. So it's really interesting some yeah. of the research that's going on. Oh, that does sound um, very, very interesting indeed. (laughs) Is there a reason, uh, an evolutionary reason why women have orgasms? This is an area of great debate. Yeah, Um, I guess we we don't know really. Yeah, we don't know. And and some of the really common things are that um, the female orgasm and some of those pelvic floor contractions that we see, some people think that that helps to sort of promote the sperm moving upwards so that it's positive for reproduction. But there's also been research that's negated that and shown Mm -hmm. that actually the sperm will move that way whether the pelvic floor is contracting or not. Um, There's also some theories that that it helps with pair bonding between couples so that you know you're more likely to reproduce if you've if you've got that strong bond between people so again another sort of evolutionary perspective Mm. um which is possible you know especially related to the release of oxytocin and and dopamine that we see with orgasm certainly sounds plausible yeah uh, as an explanation Mm. definitely i think though probably the most the, the strongest support that we have is that really the female orgasm is just an evolutionary byproduct um, so it doesn't necessarily serve a purpose in females. It's just mm-hmm. a happy byproduct that, that we experience. But we, we think that it happens because um, female and male genitals um, are produced from the same sorts of yeah. cells. And, and then occurring. they differentiate. Right? Yeah, they, and they only differentiate at about six weeks. So part of the thinking behind the female orgasm is that it's just this byproduct that we orgasm because men have to orgasm to produce sperm Mm. and to reproduce humankind. So um, it's a happy byproduct for us that we can experience. It would be a bit unfair if only men got to experience. Wouldn't it just? (laughs) Although having said that, there are some women that um, can't orgasm. Yeah, and definitely. It's about 20% or something I read. Yeah, mm. yeah. I think depending on, on who you ask and how you ask and where yeah, you ask, sure. you'll get different rates. But it's certainly such a common problem mm. in women and there's lots of factors that can influence whether women can orgasm or not. But certainly if any women or any men listening are having trouble, you know, that's a really um, common problem. But just because it's common doesn't mean that it's normal. So it's one of the things that you should head off and see your doctor about. Yeah. If, if you are having trouble with orgasm. That's really good advice to go and see your doctor and, and not sort of suffer in silence, I guess. Definitely. And again, mm. another area of taboo, but an area that's really important for healthy sexual relationships yeah. and, and um, you know, creating that bond with your partner. Yeah. So if you're missing that, it's definitely something that you should, should get help for. Mm-hmm. 
So Jane, I'd like to, it's about time to wrap up, I think. So who inspires you? I have, I've got such a great network of people around me who inspire me on a daily basis. And I'm so lucky. I'm so, so lucky for that. Um, But I think outside of my everyday little clique, my little network, Mm -hmm. um, one person in particular is Dr. Jen Gunter, who's an American gynecologist. Uh, She's doing some fabulous work for women in particular and women's health and improving health literacy in women in terms of their reproductive and pelvic health. She does some really great work in in debunking some of the really common myths around um, female sexuality and, and reproductive health. And I really love that she takes on some some big people and really negates some of the claims that people make without any evidence to back it up. She's fabulous on Twitter and on social media. She's happy to engage in debates. And I just think that she's such a powerhouse for women. Great. She's an advocate for women's health and she's just fabulous. Yeah, we need women like her. We really do. Yeah. We really do. She's a strong voice advocating for women Mm. which is fabulous and I think it's really important for our teens to engage with that kind of um, information and and understand you know to separate fact from fiction definitely and I think it's such a hard thing to do for anyone Um, but particularly with health there are a lot of sort of uh, novel things that are are promoted to us that actually have no evidence supporting whether they're, they're effective or not. Yeah. And, and to have someone who can actually call those people out and say, don't buy this, it's rubbish, it's a waste of money, yeah. is really important. Yeah, it is important because apart from it being a waste of money, it could also be a huge disappointment if you yeah. invest in something that's supposed to change your life and it doesn't work. Yeah, mm. exactly. And I think mm. teens are particularly vulnerable to being sucked into some of that advertising. Yeah. So to have someone like Jen who's who's really promoting good science and good health and good health literacy in everyone is amazing. Mm, that's great. And I think the schools these days are taking a – Um, a more engaged role in that than certainly when I was at school and we had to sort of sit there through these torturous (laughs) (laughs) sex education lessons. They're pretty awful, I think. And actually the Pelvic Pain Foundation of Australia has done some really fabulous work with promoting period pain education in schools, particularly in South Australia where they started um, where every school in South Australia, if they want to access this period pain education package, they can. And, Great. and they can have young girls access this information about if they experience pelvic pain, what can they do about mm-hmm. it and who should they turn to? And I think that's amazing. Oh, that's fantastic. I mean, that that is one of the things that's changed a lot since I was a teenager, just the access to credible information like that. Definitely, mm. definitely. And Jane, the final question I like to ask all my guests is if you could recommend two things, they don't have to be related to your <laughs> to one's pelvis, um, <laughs> that people could do to promote their well-being, what would they be? I think the first thing is just to remain curious about mm-hmm. your body and your health. Um, I think we live in such a fast-paced world that um, sometimes our health is neglected Um, But I think it's important to listen to our bodies and to kind of, yeah, be curious and and explore your body a little bit and to take some notes of what makes your body feel good and and what makes it not feel so good and try and do more of the things that make you feel good. And it's really that that word curious, that curiosity, try new things and and see if you like them. It's the only way that you can sort of work out what you like and what you don't. So curiosity is the first thing and the, the second thing I would recommend is something that I take from someone else who inspires me, Dr. Sandy Hilton, who's a pelvic floor physiotherapist from mm-hmm. Chicago. And she always says to be adventurous with movements. Oh, excellent. And I think that's a really lovely thing. You know, I think we often think of exercise as your traditional sort of going for a run or going yeah. to the gym. But I think being adventurous is so important. You know, it, it, movement and exercise can be dancing in your living room or going roller skating with friends or climbing a tree. And it, it, we don't have to be restricted to, to just your traditional things yeah, that we would consider like exercise. Going to the certain gym class at a certain time and running sort of, <laughs> that is in quotes, exercise. <laughs> <laughs> but if that works for you, that's great. Mm. 
But if it doesn't work for you, it's also great. I, I guess my my recommendation, and again, it's about being curious and being adventurous and just trying new things. And if running works for you, fabulous. And if it doesn't, also fabulous. Let's, Let's try find something else that does. There are so many options these days. There's also like belly dance, Zumba, yeah. <laughs> gymnastics, exactly. um, bar where you do like ballet sort of yes. exercises. Yes. Um, there's just so much available. I even saw during the lockdown in the States that there was a guy who went online and he offered free crumping classes. And, which and is, please tell me what that is. It's a very um, interesting style of dance, which is takes movements from sort of, um, I suppose, traditional hip hop sort of dance classes. So it was quite interesting, but he runs it particularly for people with Parkinson's, wow. which I just think is fascinating and just Oh, good on him. Yeah, exactly. A great thing to do during lockdown. So remain curious and be adventurous with your body and with your movements. Excellent advice, Jane. So, Jane, if people want to follow what you're doing, um, what's the best way for them to do that? Probably following me on Twitter Mm -hmm. is the easiest way. So my handle is at kjanecharmers. Okay, I'll I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Um, But if anyone has specific questions, I'm always happy for anyone to email me. Um, You can find me if you just uh, Google search for me. I'm at the University of South Mm -hmm. Australia. You can find my homepage, which has my email address on there. Great. Thank you so much, Jane. It's been a real pleasure talking to you today. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great. And that was Dr. Jane Chalmers, generously sharing her knowledge and personal insights into matters of the pelvis and pelvic pain. Thank you for listening today. I do hope that you found today's interview interesting or inspiring. If you did, please share the podcast and tell your friends about it. And if you could take a minute to leave a rating on Apple Podcasts, it will help people find my podcast. Please follow me on Instagram at vibrant underscore lives underscore podcast. And check out my website at www.amandaswellbeingpodcast.com. If you'd like to suggest topics, feel free to DM me or contact me via the contacts page on my website. If you enjoy my podcast and would like to support it, you can visit the donate page on my website. Another way you can support my podcast is by purchasing a book from the book reviews page on my website. If you click the Amazon link there, at no extra cost to you, I receive a small commission when you buy a book. I'm always so grateful for any support of my podcast. Thank you very much for tuning in. Eat well, move well, think well.